Hello, this is Darren Pulsifer, Chief Solution Architect of Public Sector at Intel. And welcome to Embracing Digital Transformation, where we investigate effective change leveraging people, process, and technology. On today's episode, adopting continuous improvement in cloud operations with returning guest, Christine McMonagall. Christine, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Darren. It's great to be back at the end of the series here. I know this has been great. We've had a great, um, we've brought in some of our cloud solution architects and our experts in cloud. You're the bookends because you are the queen <laughs> of cloud, which I like. Um, but we want to finish up today specifically talking about agility, right? And yeah. adopting kind of that agile, continuous improvement uh, concept in cloud. So exactly, let us have it, Christine. Yeah, I mean, I think the idea is that you've modernized a set of workloads at this point, you've determined where and on what cloud infrastructure you want to place them, you've deployed those applications or modernized workloads, but of course, it doesn't end there. And so that's what we wanted to talk about today. Uh, what's next? What do you do from this point on? And well, yeah, because that's a big problem that people run into, right? They have mm -hmm. all these big cloud migration plans, right? Ooh, I, I mapped it all out. I'm doing it well. And then it's over. Exactly. But it's not ever over is what you're saying. That's right. It's not over. Even on those, those initial workloads that you modernized and placed in your cloud, you want to go back at this point and monitor those measure whether they are meeting your business objectives and success metrics for the cloud and for those particular workloads or business challenges. You wanna really empower your developers and your ops teams to work together to be able to iterate, fine tune, um, improve on their success as well. Well, so this brings up something interesting, and, and we're seeing it in some uh, some industries more than others, um, that I have adopted this continuous. We're starting to see some people look at their workloads differently and even repatriate them back on-prem. That's true. Is that because they're, they're evaluating uh, continuously and saying, hey, we're not getting out of the cloud what we thought we were, or... Maybe we're going to switch from Azure to AWS or AWS to Google or, or vice versa. It doesn't matter. So mm -hmm. that, that continuous improvement, doesn't that cause a lot of thrash? Well, you could look at it as thrash or you could look at it as part of your iterative journey and part of fine tuning for success. And I, I think it's important to look at it that way and to set those expectations up front that it's not just a one and done. Conditions are going to change or your metrics may not be met in quite the way you expected. You know, perhaps a set of employees is having trouble accessing the workload or perhaps it's too costly in wherever you initially placed it or isn't meeting the performance requirements. And so it's really important to have that um, flexibility and agility in your cloud operating model to be able to make adjustments over time. You know, no life cycle or no application is, is unchanged over its life cycle. And it's really important to plan to have that flexibility and agility in your model to be able to move a workload around or make additional updates to an application in order to best meet your business objectives. So I, I find this really interesting. I was actually talking to a customer uh, this week. Um, they have an application running on a mainframe that was written in the 1960s. Wow. It is the, it is the oldest application, software application running in the world today. And they're like in government. anywhere, anywhere at like all, anywhere in the world. Oh my gosh! How did they um, figure I, that out? That's amazing. I, well, MIT, MIT figured it out, right? Because those guys are smart. There was a, mm. one older than it that was just retired. But this goes into something interesting, um, and the reason I bring it up is because they're they're stuck with this boat anchor. 
Yeah. There's only maybe a dozen people in the world that know the language it's written in. It's written in COBOL, oh. maybe a couple, uh, maybe a, uh, five or six dozen. Right, right. And they say, and we hired most of them. And, <laughs> and they go, oh. we just don't, we don't know what to do with this thing because it's become such an integral part of business, day-to-day -day business for them. Wow. And there's no agility in it at all. It's yeah. just a boat anchor. So when they talk about modernizing, they can't move. Yeah. So what you're saying is it's kind of a, it's an attitude or a, mm -hmm. a paradigm that you have to adopt. Paradigm. That yes. you're not locked into one thing. Otherwise you end up with these uh, albatross around your neck or whatever, you know, these these big, huge programs that that keep you back into the last millennium. Exactly. That's right. Yeah, you really need to um, be able to make improvements over time. And you also need to be able to, you know, move on to your next set of workloads or next set of applications and take the approaches that worked well and bring those forward. And approaches that didn't work as well, you need to be able to go back and, and adjust and fine tune to take a slightly different approach and learn over time what works best. And, and that may be different, a different answer for different workloads at different stages of their life or at different criticality levels for your business. So what, what I'm hearing is flexibility is part of that agility, right? Being able exactly to... Right. So, so does that require when you're architecting a solution mm. that you architect it up front for that uh, ability for it to be on-prem or in the cloud or in certain clouds? That's Is that right. part, of, part of all this? I mean, you're, you're making um, modernization updates to your application, let's say, based on the five or six R's, right? You've decided to refactor, you've decided to retain it as is, or you've decided to, um, you know, just, just place it in a, in a new location. And this is then where your, where your infrastructure layer really comes into play. The more you have a consistent infrastructure across your clouds, and I mean both hardware and software infrastructure, the easy it is to build in that agility so that you have the flexibility to be able to make more adjustments or move a workload again over time. So, so this is almost contrary to what the cloud service providers are offering mm -hmm. then because mm -hmm. they want um, uniqueness, right, in their solution. That's right. Um, right. They want to lock you in. So what you're saying is you have to resist that temptation. That's right. Um, to, to get with services that are not consistent across the clouds. Is that, that's what I'm hearing. Is that right? Yeah. Or, or recognize up front that you are perhaps taking advantage of something unique in one particular cloud. And if there's business reasons to move it to a different location, you will have to make some additional changes to accommodate that or remove so that some, customization based on the one cloud provider. So there's some my, uh, future migration costs involved. If, for example, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll use the one that everyone uses, Lambda, for example, on AWS. Mm -hmm. If I tie myself to Lambda, Lambda on AWS, I'm on Lambda. I'm, <laughs> I'm stuck on AWS. I can't go to Azure. I can't yeah. bring it on-prem easily unless I have an alternative to that, that I could use because there are other function as a service offerings out there. Um, That's right. But, you know, if you're planning out your cloud strategy and part of your strategy is to have a hybrid and multi-cloud approach, you do want to avoid that lock-in as much as possible. That's generally what um, one of the key tenets that um, organizations are are or one of the key reasons that organizations are adopting that multi-cloud approach. So as long as you recognize those things up front and try to plan for, you know, using open APIs and um, being able to use that consistent infrastructure to be able to move workloads around as much as possible, that will serve you well moving forward in the future. Okay, cool. All right, let's let us let us shift gears a little bit and talk okay. about, I've got everything running. Everything's running great. Okay. How do I, and I, and you're telling me I'm not done. 
a continuous <laughs> improvement. That's right. So where, where do I look for improvement? I mean, in what are the key things I should be looking at to improve? I, hmm. The most obvious one to me is cost. That's right. Cost is, is um, the thing that jumps to mind first, I would say, for sure. And but other things as well, like what um, were your performance or latency expectations for this particular workload? What were the security requirements? What is the access needed by um, your workforce? And so all those could play into that um, decision to potentially adjust a workload again. And, um, you know, the more you can assess those up front, of course, the better. But not everyone has perfect visibility and not every cloud location will perform as expected, right? So those are the kinds of things I would look for. Scalability, I guess, would also be another one, right? If you find over time, you need to be able to scale this workload more than you expected. That could also play into that evaluation of, of what's working well and what's not working well. So I can't take a I can't take peanut butter and spread it across the whole thing. I have to take each workload based off of its service level agreement or quality of service that I want out of it, evaluate it against that cost, most definitely uh, responsiveness, security, reliability. So all those factor into yeah. it. Sounds sounds like this is a this is a fundamental shift in the way that I do IT. Because I mean, now I'm looking at optimize. I'm I'm continuously looking at how can I improve what I ha currently have. That's right. And you know, we talked. You just talked about every single workload or application. I mean, you may be able to sort of bucket them together, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I look at, for example, Intel IT and their cloud strategy, they have sort of, you know, a few different buckets of things that are sort of standardized applications, such as for sales or HR or finance, those kinds of things, they sort of bucket together and take one approach, generally a SaaS approach. Then if you look at workloads that are particularly differentiated for your business, that are really critical to how you deliver your goods and services and differentiate yourself in the market. Those perhaps you want to keep on your private cloud and, um, and devote more um, attention to optimizing. And then maybe a third bucket is new or emerging things that you're exploring, um, new business opportunities or new ways of addressing the market or delivering uh, user experience for your customers. You know, those kinds of more experimental things perhaps could be bucketed together and you could, like yeah, you know, put those in a certain location and find out if that approach will work for you over time. Or as those experimental things evolve into a more stable business opportunity, then maybe it moves into a different bucket. No, okay. I like. I actually like this quite a bit, especially especially the one where you said, "What is differentiating for me?" Right. Yeah, that I don't go to a SaaS with that. That's your special sauce. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. No, I, I like that a lot. I um because uh, as a, as a former CIO, it was always difficult to know. Well, what do I? What's important? Mm -hmm. What do I offshore? Because SaaS is really offshoring, right? Or mm -hmm. outsourcing. And what do I keep inside? And I love that concept of what's important, what are you good at, what's special. Uh, so I, I really like, like that approach. Does Intel have any tools or best known methods, best practices mm -hmm. around optimizing my workloads, around workload mm -hmm. placement, thing, things like that, that... Maybe give me, I, I, I probably won't follow exactly what Intel does, but at least it gives me uh, some examples, right? It, does yeah. Intel IT produce anything like that that says, hey, this is what we decided to do? Or I think or Intel IT tools? has published some papers on that that we could certainly refer people to. But Intel also has a number of cloud optimization tools that we have either developed or acquired to offer our customers and um, try to help them optimize their journey to the cloud. You know, things like Intel Migration Advisor that we developed with Cloud Genera that really helps people sort of assess and optimize um, their workload placement. 
things like Granulate, um, which is a company that we acquired that really provides this continuous real-time optimization and it works completely autonomously without affecting the application itself. Those wow, kinds that's... of tools are really, really helpful in this journey so that you don't have to treat everything as a unique hands-on um, project. Well, and, that, and that'll, save, that'll save me money in the end. Exactly. All right. So we've talked about these five real big strat. There are steps to the strategy. What would we call them? Right. Yeah. Kind I guess of like best practices or yeah. Or steps on the journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and, and this is the pinnacle one, right? Keep doing what, what we told you to do. Right. <laughs> Continuously. And then scale it to the next set of workloads or new business challenges you want to address. Things that aren't working, go back and adjust and fine tune. This sounds a lot like Six, six Sigma. It sounds a lot yeah. like that continuous improvement. But now we're applying it to our IT, which, you know, maybe maybe if those th that one customer of mine would have done that to that um, program that, how many years old is that? 60 years old? I can't even believe that. Wow. 60 years old. No kidding. Um, yeah, maybe if they use that, but yeah, who knows? <laughs> That's right. I don't know if that existed at that time, or at least they weren't thinking no, about it. No, no, probably, probably not. And, right? <laughs> yeah, and they came to me saying, Darren, we need your help getting off this six-year-old program. I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll work on that. Well, <laughs> So, hey, let, let's review a little bit um, the best-known practices we talked about in the series. We started off with mm -hmm. you. That's right. Yeah, we talked about addressing barriers up front, how to identify potential risks and mitigate them in your in your planning process. Mm -hmm. Right. And then we followed that up with, if I remember right, it was Rajiv. Uh, um, yes. Developing your cloud strategy and operating model or refining it if you already have one. Yep. I really, mm -hmm. I, you know, that, that was fascinating to listen to his uh, approach on this because he deals with and this is fascinating. It's amazing to me that Intel hired a bunch of cloud solution architects from other com companies and uh, yeah. even internally. And why would we do that? Why would we, why would we go about doing that? Well, I think we want to bring in different viewpoints and build up our expertise, right? By bringing in people with different perspectives and experiences, right? So as we've said, this is an iterative journey and that iterative part can be bringing together all of those different levels of expertise and, um, you know, applying those to both our business and, and helping our customers. Right. Okay. And the next, after, after we talked to Rajiv about um, strategy, um, next was uh, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah Music. Yeah. Talking about your assessing your portfolio of applications and workloads, determining what to modernize and how to modernize them. The five or six R's, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exa exactly. And then we finished up with uh, Rico Dutton. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Rico talked about what? What was that? That was on workload placement factors and how to determine right. where to place your workload and um, and how, what mix of private and public clouds to use. So it sounds like if I take those four practices that you just talked about, mm -hmm. and in this fifth practice of continuous improvement, I'm using all four of those, but now instead of taking months, I'm doing it all the time. That's right? true, so, yeah. So, so where do I learn how to do this? Because this is a new skill set for a lot of organizations, mm -hmm. right? So where yeah. can I best find information on how to do this stuff? I think we talked about um, some resources and, um, you know, really the need to set those kinds of expectations with your stakeholders up front that it is a learning process, right? And that, um, you know, no two journeys to the cloud and different organizations are going to be the same. So some of it is going to necessarily be trial and error, but there are a lot of useful um, documents 
and um, and other types of collateral that's available to help guide you on that journey. Right, and and you, uh, you for for our listeners, go ahead and go to embracingdigital.org. We have links to all of this collateral right there, so you can you can take a look at that stuff. Um, Christine, also, I was thinking about in in my crazy crazy head that I have. Mm. This sounds like this is not just a task force that you give someone to do cloud migration. This is now a new part of your IT organization um, that you want, right? A continuous right. workload improvement. I what would you call it, right? Let's yeah. name, let's coin something right now, Christine. <laughs> well, I have heard some people call it sort of their cloud center of excellence that they you know pull oh, okay. together people from different IT disciplines in order to bring in those different perspectives and cut across silos and traditional IT boundaries as the cloud does and really kind of build that set of expertise and skill sets over time and um, you know really empower your IT teams to learn to work together to collaborate and um, and you know build their skill sets at the same time that your organization is advancing. Uh, so organizational change is a key aspect for this, it sounds like. That's exactly right. Yeah. You know, we think of, I think I mentioned this in the first one, actually, we think of moving to the cloud as a technical process, but really at its heart, it's change management. And like any yeah. other change, um, it can be painful, right? <laughs> but the more you can sort of plan for it and take a structured approach to identifying, you know, your, your steps, starting with your business challenges, you know, really figuring out how your objectives will respond to those business challenges and opportunities, um, you know, developing that cloud strategy and operating model or refining that over time, um, you know, starting small with a few priority workloads and then um, you know, these approaches that worked well, build on that success by using those again. And, um, and the ones that didn't work as well, provide yourself the, the, um, the grace, the flexibility to be able to iterate and improve on those over time. Um, th th this has been great. I think you've kind of laid out um, a great strategy. Uh, for uh, organizations looking to make uh, these changes. Christine, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Great um, talking to you, Darren. So, this has uh, been th a great thanks series. Again. Yeah, it has. It's been fun to do this series. And um, if, uh, if people want uh, more, just, just go, to, uh, go to our website. You'll find a lot more there and how to contact uh, Intel and our, mm -hmm. uh, and our cloud solution uh, expertise. So That's right. Thanks, Christine, for coming on. Great. Thank you, Darren. Talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to Embracing Digital Transformation today. If you enjoyed our podcast, give it five stars on your favorite podcasting site or YouTube channel. You can find out more information about Embracing Digital Transformation at embracingdigital.org. Until next time, go out and do something wonderful.